Min Meidani, Professor of Nutrition and Immunology at Tufts University and Senior Scientist at John Mayer USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts. I would like to thank you all for joining today's webinar, which is being hosted by the Food Forum of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Uh, the Food Forum convenes scientists, administrators, and policymakers from academia, government, industry, and public sectors on an ongoing basis to discuss problems and issues related to food and to identify possible approaches for addressing those problems and issues. It does not make recommendations, nor does it offer a specific advice. However, it does compile information, develop options, and bring interested parties together to cons consider those issues and to find solutions for them. Before we start, I would like to thank the Food Forum membership for taking an interest in the topic of food and aging. And I would like to extend a special thanks to the planning group that was instrumental in development of this program. And that includes Christina Hu, Sarah Olhurst, Sharon Ross, and Dorothy Bafiades. And I also want to give a special thanks to Cypress Links, without whom this webinar would have not been possible. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded and the slides will be posted on the website in the coming weeks, but there will be no published proceedings. The discussion today is meant to provide an introduction to potentially larger topic for the forum to cover in the future. We will hear today from four experts on this topic uh, and their uh, presentations will be followed by a 45 minutes discussion uh, at the end of the session. Uh, and please feel free to type your questions into the chat box during and after the presentations. And please specify in your note if your question is directed toward one is a specific speaker or all of the speakers. And please note that the bio sketches of all the speakers can be found on the Food Forum website. So I'm not going to be giving lengthy introduction to the speakers in order to be able to take full advantage of their uh, uh, time or give them um, their full time and additional time to be able to provide you with their expert opinion. So without further ado, I would like to present our first speaker, Dr. Lisa McGuire, who is the lead for CDC's Alzheimer's Disease and Healthy Aging Program. Uh, Dr. McGuire, please start us off. Great, thank you so much for the opportunity to share um, our work at CDC, as well as to provide some ground setting or level setting information about the topic. So first, what do we mean by a healthy brain? So having a healthy brain means we are doing what, doing things to try to keep our brain's abilities and functioning so we can remember, learn, play, and concentrate through various activities such as nutrition and some other risk reduction activities that we will talk about. So when we talk about brain health, we're talking about doing what we can to keep our brains as healthy as long as possible, as well as we're talking about when our brains are not remaining healthy. So one of those distinctions that we make is just normal brain health. So what happens to our brains as we get older versus what happens when there is a cognitive impairment or a pathology? Everybody forgets things. But the difference is when somebody who has normal, normal brain aging typically forgets something or loses something, they can retrace their steps or track and figure out where they might where they might have left those keys when they came in with the groceries. They might have dropped them on the counter and they don't usually drop them on the counter, but they can retrace their steps to figure out what they have where those that item might be. Another term that we use quite a bit is called dementia. And so what dementia is, is dementia is an umbrella term, as you can see here on the right hand side, and it really is describing a group of conditions that result in changes in brain health, really cognitive changes in cognitive functioning that actually interfere with a person's daily life or their daily functioning. 
We know that Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, but there are other types of causes of dementia that give that irreversible progressive decline in cognitive functioning. Scientifically, we know that many, if not most causes of dementia or have actually multiple causes. So for example, a person may have Alzheimer's disease and also Lewy body dementia. So CDC's former director and our former Surgeon General, Dr. David Satcher said that Alzheimer's disease is the most unrecognized threat to public health in the 21st century. So what do we know about Alzheimer's disease? We know that Alzheimer's disease um, is impacts the lives of more than 5 million people. Um, we see that it is typically related to the age of the person. So of those 5 million people, the majority of them are over the age of 65 and about 100,000 people annually are diagnosed under the age of 65. We see that the majority of them are women. An important statistic that I want you to think about and remember as you're having your conversations today, about 70% of people who have Alzheimer's disease live in a community setting. So that means they are residing at home either by themselves or with loved ones. Um, and um, then, but about a quarter of them are actually living alone. So what I want us to take from this is when we think about communal settings, such as assisted living or nursing homes, that's about, about a third of people who do have Alzheimer's disease are residing in one of those communal settings. What else do we know? So some of the most recent death data shows us that of people aged 65 years and older, Alzheimer's disease is the fifth leading cause of death. If we look at all ages, it is the sixth leading cause of death. What else do we know? We know that there are racial and ethnic disparities related to Alzheimer's disease. We see that people who are African-American descent or Hispanic, Latino, or American Indian, Alaska Native tend to have a higher prevalence. And we do expect the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease to continue to increase over time. A Couple more facts that I want us to keep in mind for framing our conversation today. So the first three facts are national objectives that I'm showing you on this slide through Healthy People 2030. We know that about a third of people who are diagnosed with some type of dementia or their caregiver are aware of their diagnosis. Okay, so what we know is about two thirds of people who have a diagnosis and the key is have a diagnosis are aware of that or their caregivers are aware of that. We also know that many hospitalizations that occur for people who do have Alzheimer's disease or related dementia are actually preventable. We know that about 25% of those are preventable. And so at CDC and across the government, we are really looking at ways to reduce those preventable hospitalizations uh, because they are very stressful for a person who has Alzheimer's or related dementia, as well as their family and caregivers. The third of those national healthy people objectives is that we know less than half of people who say my memory has gotten worse in the past year have actually spoken with a healthcare provider about that. So we see this as an opportunity when people are, if they're having challenges with their memory or noticing changes, that it's a great opportunity for them to speak with a provider about those concerns. And if necessary to get screened and to think and learn about ways they can manage their other health conditions, their other chronic conditions, whether they receive a diagnosis or not. Um, I think this, this fourth bullet is extremely important as well. When we are talking about, um, when we are talking about people who have Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, we know that the majority of them have other chronic conditions Many will result in the, of their conditions will result in the need for caregivers or caregivers in the future. And we know that one out of three of those caregivers say that their health has worsened due to caregiving. So one of the, the main focuses at CDC is reducing the risk of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And this is a, a great role for public health. 
because public health has the opportunity to increase awareness about the connections between brain health and physical health um, and linking dementia and also cognitive decline risk messaging to other health promotion activities. This, this slide shows us the life course of a person who will develop dementia. We can see on those outer rings of this graphic where public health has the opportunity to intervene. We have the opportunity to intervene with risk reduction, which is the focus of my presentation today, but we also have other opportunities to intervene for people who have been diagnosed with the condition because many of the, the, data, is, the data are showing us that there are various risk reduction activities that can affect the progress of the disease or the speed with which a disease progress progresses. Um, and the same thing re resulting in the safety and quality of care about managing those, those other chronic health conditions to try to reduce preventable hospitalizations and also to keep those caregivers healthy and healthy as long as possible. So I've talked a little bit about risk reduction. So when we talk about the space of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, this slide highlights us for us some of the, the, the possible, the modifiable risk factors that have the strongest evidence associated with them. We can see that the majority of these risk factors are cardiovascular related and, and much of the research has indicated that many of the activities or many of the risk reduction techniques for cardiovascular conditions are also risk factors for brain health as well. Um, at CDC, one of the things that we have done is we develop a roadmap every five years which identifies priority actions uh, for public health uh, and various health professionals across the nation. One of those that we have developed explicitly is on risk reduction. So this risk reduction um, issue brief shows us why risk reduction is extremely important, what the compelling data is, what the national priority items are, as well as some examples of strategies that have been used in states and jurisdictions. We have other of these issue maps on other related topics that might be relevant. We have a series of continuing education courses and materials that are available. One is through the American College of Preventive Medicine. Um, this is a free continuing education course that you can register for and receive that credit. We also have a series of other materials that were developed in collaboration with our partners at the Alzheimer's Association, really doing a deeper dive and focusing more on that connection between uh, cardiovascular health and also brain health. We have some additional materials that have been developed for tribal communities, which really illustrate those connections as well. One of the main reasons that we have an emphasis on tribal communities is because the increased disparities and in prevalence in Alzheimer's disease and related dementias for people who are American Indian and Alaskan natives. Just gonna show you these last couple of slides. These are some additional materials that were developed um, with one of our partners as well. And there's some short videos. And the last thing I will share with you today is the newest product that we are the most excited I'm very, very excited about. This was developed with the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors. And these are a series of rack cards. And they, they are two pages, a front and a back. And so you're seeing the fronts of these rack cards that are emphasizing some of the, the main, main public health messages related to diabetes, related to hypertension, related to physical activity, um, and also uh, nutrition. And these have been developed with our partners at CDC. And so these are taking established chronic disease messages and where the science is strong enough, making that linkage and connection to how those health promotion activities can also promote brain health. Uh, we've just recently funded our first bold public health center of risk reduction, uh, which was awarded to the Alzheimer's Association the 1st of October. We have a series of podcasts on a variety of topics, some in English, some in Spanish. And so in summary today, we know that Alzheimer's disease has a tremendous impact on our society and our families, and that public health does have a role and can have a role in helping mitigate some of that risk. Please sign up for our newsletter if you have not. 
And I thank you so much for your time and attention. And I so will quit sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Dr. McGuire, for that wonderful presentation to get us started. And uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Barbara Shaket Hale, uh, from also from John Mayer USDA uh, Human Nutrition Research Center um, at Tufts University. D Dr. Shaket Hale is a USDA staff scientist in the Laboratory of Neuroscience and Aging at Tufts University. Dr. Uh, Shaket Hale. Thank you very much, Shamin, for that kind introduction. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about um, nutrition and how it can impact your cognitive function. I just want to let you know that I, as Shamin said, I work for the USDA and some of the research support for some of these um, clinical trials that I'll talk about came from the California Strawberry Commission and the U.S. Highbush Blueberry Council. And as we heard about in the last talk, um, why is this important? Because as we age, um, the population of the in the United States by 2050, 30% of the population will be over the age of 55. And as we know, many will exhibit the impairments in cognitive and motor function. And as we heard in the last talk, some of this will be due to Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, but we'll also see these changes with normal brain aging. Also, as we heard about in the last talk, um, there are several things that decline with age. Um, such as reasoning, spatial visual, visualization, memory, and speed, one good thing is that our vocabulary knowledge actually increases with age. But it's these cognitive declines that we're most interested in. And why does this happen? Um, main factors are oxidative stress and inflammation. Because the brain utilizes so much of the body's oxygen, 20% at rest and up to 50% when we're thinking, um, and these increase with age and the brain becomes more sensitive to them. And it's inflammation, oxidative stress or reduced maintenance functions and genetic changes appear to make the brain more vulnerable to cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. Therefore, we must find strategies to improve behavior, possibly by changing the neuronal environment by altering oxidative stress and inflammation. And research in our lab and others has shown that the behavioral deficits we see in aging can be retarded and maybe even reversed by some of the polyphenols in foods, possibly by increasing antioxidant and anti-inflammatory levels. And our next speaker will specifically talk about the polyphenol. This all came about when uh, about 20 years ago, the man in the lab next to ours was Dr. Um, Ron Pryor, and he developed this um, test, an ORAC test, which basically measured the antioxidant capacity of different substances. And when he started running foods through this test, he found that particularly the darker color ones like blueberries and blackberries and black plums and raspberries, a lot of the berry fruits as you see, were high on this scale. Therefore, they were good antioxidants. So we decided, well, what would happen if we feed these foods um, rats in our model of aging? Would we see um, improvements with age? And in all of our um, implementation studies, and we've probably done 10 to 15 over the past 20 years, we fed the rats and they were old when we started at 19 months of age, which is like a 65 year old human. And we supplemented their diet for about two months, typically at around 2% of the diet, which in blueberries might be a half a cup to a cup a day. And we also did, we also put the foods on top of an already healthy diet for the animals. And in some of the studies, they actually drank um, juice, but for most of them, we added either the fruit, vegetable, or even like walnuts to the diet. And what we found, and we had a battery of motor and cognitive tests. This is just one example. It's called a rotor rod in which the animal has to slowly walk on this rod, which gets faster every 30 seconds. It's a good measure of balance and coordination. And we found that the blueberry and strawberry diet allowed the animals to stay on this uh, rod longer than the control diet. We also had a test of cognition in which the animal has to find a hidden platform in a pool of water. And long story short, um, the blueberry and strawberry diet um, enabled the animals to find that platform faster using the spatial cues in the room on a second trial once they had um, they had tried to, they had found it the first trial. So it's a good test of spatial memory. 
and the blueberry and strawberry diet were able to improve the animal's function in this test. Our nutritional interventions were able to reverse deficits in learning and memory and declines in motor performance. And again, importantly, these beneficial effects were seen even when superimposed on an already well-fortified healthy diet. And over the years, we've done several different, um, as I said, about 10 to 15 different studies. And we found that these um, foods here on the left improve memory and or motor function. And all these are published um, and you can go look them up if, you, if you'd like. But things like cranberries and raspberries and walnuts, and even coffee um, had a beneficial effect in these animal studies. But the thing that everyone is really asking is, well, do these results seen in your animal studies translate to humans? Um, so along with Marshall Miller in the lab, we conducted a small pilot study just to see if we could find deficits in tests that we had chosen in cognition and mobility. And we were able to do that. And that's published, uh, all my uh, citations are down here. You can look up the papers. Um, and so these tests importantly paralleled the changes that we saw in the rodent studies where, where we did see improvements with interventions. And our first um, clinical trial looked at dietary blueberry to improve mobility and cognition among older adults. And it was a double blind placebo controlled trial with healthy adults aged 60 to 75. And we were able to give them um, freeze dried blueberry or an identical matched placebo powder equivalent to about a cup a day for three months. We had them come in at baseline and midpoint and then 90 days later. And we measured a couple different outcomes in this test, but I wanna just highlight a couple of them over here on the right, um, the task switching test and the California verbal learning test. The task switching test is a very difficult test of mental flexibility where the participants have to make it to split seconds decisions. And what we found was that there was no difference between the control and the blueberry and how fast they could do this test. Where there was a big difference was in the number of errors committed on this test. And we found that, especially at the 90 days, the blueberry diet down here had less errors on this test than the placebo diet. Um, you started to see the trend at 45 days, but it was significant um, and striking at the 90 days. So they're committing less errors. The California Verbal Learning Test is a list learning test where we read the participants 20 words and then they have to recall them um, in several different scenarios. And again, um, there was no difference in the number of correct um, between the control and blueberry, but where we did see a difference was in the ability of the participants in the blueberry diet um, and repetition errors. So when they would tell us um, the, the, the words on the list, Sometimes the participants repeat the words because they can't remember if they said it. But the blueberry diet, there was a nice interaction. The control at day 90 made more errors and the blueberry diet made less errors. Therefore, blueberry improved measures of executive function. And these have been associated with prefrontal cortex function, which is very vulnerable to age-related decline. Our second study looked at dietary strawberry in the same model, healthy older adults. Um, age 60 to 75. And again, we gave them freeze-dried strawberry or matched placebo. It was equivalent to about two cups a day and the same for three months. And again, I wanna highlight tests over here and under learning and memory. One was that we had a virtual Mars water maze in which we had the participants swim in a virtual environment to fly in that platform. There was no difference in latency between the two groups, but where we did see a difference was in something called the probe trial where we, on the last trial, we basically take the platform out to measure how many times they swim across where the platform was or in that quadrant where the platform was. And the strawberry participants, particularly at day 45, swam in that quadrant longer than the control diet. They also remembered more words on the California verbal learning tests. Therefore, strawberry improved measures of spatial and recognition memory as opposed to the blueberry, which was more executive function. And these measures have been um, associated with the hippocampus, which is another area of the brain, particularly vulnerable to age-related de degeneration. Therefore, functional declines in mobility and cognition are key features of aging in humans and rodents, and easily achievable quantities of berry fruit 
we saw were able to improve some aspects of cognition. Unfortunately, our measures of mobility were not improved and some of the easier tests of cognition were not improved because we think our sample was too healthy. We, as I said, we have healthy older adults age 60 to 75. Therefore, we're doing a follow-up study with strawberries in a less healthy population to, and making the tests a little more difficult to see if, um, if it helps um, that population. Interestingly, we saw that different berry fruit might improve different aspects of cognition. And we had seen this in an earlier rodent study, which I put the citation for here. So that might be indicate that you need to eat different foods um, for different benefits. And I put another citation down here from Grant Rutledge in the lab, um, a, new, a newer one showing that even though that the blueberry and strawberry did not alter levels of inflama inflammatory biomarkers, when we use that serum that from participants that had eaten the blueberry, we were able to show reduction of inflammatory stress signals in a, in a cell culture model. Overall, we see that um, cognitive demand seems critical on these tests. The more cognitive demand, the more of these um, foods might help. But we also are seeing executive function and attention, learning and memory and processing speed improved by these um, foods. I just put a slide in here, which I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on of possible mechanisms of these beneficial effects that we've seen over the years. Importantly, not only do they, are they good antioxidant and anti-inflammatories, but they also seem to have direct effects on the brain, on the membranes and signaling, increasing new neurons, et cetera. Therefore, eating foods such as berries may help prevent or reverse age-related declines in cognition and brain function. We think this is due to the polyphenols and other components in the food. And these components may act to inhibit or reduce inflammation and oxidative stress, but also to enhance protective mechanisms. And we've also found that whole foods may be more effective um, than taking apart some of the um, components. Therefore, in order to choose what food you should eat for thought, you should give some thought to your food. And with that, I'd like to just thank the people in the lab currently and in the lab in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chacatel. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. David uh, Wazur. Dr. Wazur is Senior Research Fellow in Molecular Nutrition at the Norwich Medical School at the University of East Angelia. Dr. Wazur. Thank you very much. I'm actually trying to find my presentation, which I lost suddenly. <laughs> there we go. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, polyphenols and health today. Um, so it's been presented very nicely by my two colleagues before. Uh, there are different risk factors for brain vulnerability. And there you have actually, obviously, age, family, history, genetics, uh, then also intermediate risk factors such as cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, uh, but interestingly, the one we are focusing today is the one that we can modify your physical activity, for example, the stress, the tobacco, alcohol, drug use, and more importantly for us, the uh, healthy diet. So there are, there are a lot of different food bioactive, and we've seen that with uh, Dr. Shekhet Hale, uh, but the one I'm going to focus on are the polyphenols. So what are these? Uh, dietary polyphenols are, are plant bioactives. You're going to find mainly in fruit and vegetables. Uh, you have different classes of these, what we call polyphenol um, flavonoids or non-flavonoids. So for example, the citrus fruits will contain flavanones like aspartin or naranginin in high concentration. Berry fruits will contain these uh, anthocyanins that gives the blue to red colors. Uh, cocoa, for example, will be rich in flavanols, for example. Also tea is the same, uh, flavanol. Red wine will also contain some of these components. Um, few studies were, were carried out. Uh, the first one was about uh, in 2007, the Packwheat study, where they observed that the reduction in global um, impact of the, the uh, actual uh, cognitive decline 
was uh, improved by the consumption of higher uh, flavonoid intake. This study was further um, consolidated by very recent uh, work carried out on the Framingham uh, offspring cohort, where they observed that, in fact, certain type of flavonoids, in particular the flavanones, the sorry, the flavanol, and the flavanfriols, were able to in have an impact on your brain function. Uh, this, sorry. This went as well to uh, further demonstrating that dementia was also uh, uh, modified by uh, the intake of these polyphenols. In particular, compared to the uh, participants having the lowest intake of uh, polyphenols and flavonoids, those taking in the quintile, the fifth quintile, taking the highest concentration up to 195 milligrams per day, we're having about 50% lower risk of dementia. So this is an important uh, factor and for us to understand uh, what's going on. So the main question is how do they exert their beneficial effect? Um, so Barbara just presented a few of those, uh, but I will be mainly focusing on uh, neuronal morphology and uh, what we call synaptic plasticity and also the vascular effect. There are also obviously the anti-inflammatory effect, uh, but I will not present those today. So for the synaptic plasticity, for example, we conducted a few years ago a study with uh, blueberries um, and we demonstrated that in young animals, uh, sorry, in animals fed with blueberries, we were improving uh, memory formation, memory consolida consolidation. Uh, that was mainly driven by signal signaling pathways involved in brain maintenance and uh, synaptic plasticity like CRAB or BDNF. BDNF, the brain neurotrophic factor, is important for memory formation. Um, further work actually we conducted as well in human was to look into how these polyphenols may affect the vascular function uh, and in particular the one in the brain. So work for example conducted with cytoflavonoids, so the one you find in citrus and orange juice for example, we observed that following intake of this and after two hours intake we were able to observe uh, a perfusion of uh, bl uh, blood across the brain, improving especially actually uh, formation into the frontal gyrus and the medial and inferior frontal gyrus, which are important in memory formation. Uh, but the picture is a bit more complex. Um, in fact, what uh, your polyphenol and over lifestyle do is important to affect many other things like the genes and the microbiome, um, microbiome in, in general. So all of these will uh, produce a specific phenotype and each person will have that particular phenotype. So I will concentrate on the microbiota. Uh, so we know, for example, that the microbiome is changing as we're getting older. Uh, very elegant work by Paul O'Toole in Ireland demonstrated that actually as we're getting older, the microbiome is shifting. Certain bacteria clusters are changing and we have different diversity of these bacteria. Uh, interestingly, uh, there are many, many work now over the last 10 years demonstrating that we can link the gut to the brain and in particular through different mechanisms. The first one, for example, is the production of neurotransmitters from tryptophan, for example, or serotonin formation, which are all formed by your gut uh, microbes. And they can actually transit through your brain to your brain through the vagus nerve. Uh, your microbiome as well, or microbiota, also contain functionality that are able to stimulate immune cells, produce cytokines. These are important for the maintenance of your immunity. And we all know, already know that there are direct connection between these uh, particular bacterial cluster, what we call dysbiosis in that case, and the brain functioning. And the last one is actually use of fermented products and in 
particular fibers in the production of short chain fatty acids. An example of this one is butyrite, for example, which has been demonstrated to affect epigenetically the synthesis of the brain derotrophic factor. So let's take an example. I mean, these polyphenols are complex structure, and I'm going to take an example with this particular procyanidin, which are uh, a component which is mainly a polymer. These are very, uh, are actually not much uh, absorbed, and instead they're going to be degraded by our uh, gut microbiota. When the first moiety of the epicatechin is released from the procyanidin, it could be absorbed here in the liver <clears throat> and be transformed into their glucuronide or sulfated forms. Those not being absorbed are going to be degraded into smaller phenolics that we call gamma varolactone, for example. They're going to go as well into systemic circulation through the enterohepatic recirculation and be metabolized as well uh, into secondary forms. Uh, so as you see, there is a direct effect of those polyphenols on the gut microbiota. And an example for this was a study that was conducted a few years ago uh, using SHIM in particular here, where we um, introduced uh, some cocoflavanols with uh, bacteria. What we observed is the high flavanol content was able to produce higher amount of bifidobacteria or lactobacteria and decrease the number of clostridium uh, so clostridium are, are the bad guys, really. Uh, bifido and lactobacilli are the good guys, just to simplify. Uh, interestingly as well, if you look at the cranberries, uh, they are very rich in procyanidin, so these are component. And uh, human investigation into the um, actual microbiota diversity uh, observed that subjects uh, tended to cluster with themselves. And importantly, cranberry intake was increasing Acumentia mucinifida uh, increase in these people. So Acumentia is a bacteria involved mainly in uh, the production of some uh, mucus. Uh, and they are very, very good uh, for maintenance in obese people. Uh, all of this is important when we look at the global picture because these microbiome are going to interact with your liver and there are different um, systems in place like your intestine, adipose, tissue, liver, brain access. Uh, one of the possibility is through the bile acid homeostasis, for example. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen this very recent uh, paper demonstrating networks of specific bile acid in the brain of Alzheimer's disease patient, demonstrating that these bile acid were modified as we were getting the, the disease. What we observed recently was actually that flavonoids were able to modify uh, bile acid uh, metabolism, and in particular by activating specific enzymes related to uh, the bile acid modification. In particular, these flavanols here were able to increase this CYP7A1 enzyme, which is very important for the bile acid modification. I thank you very much for your attention and um, would take any questions afterwards. Thank you so much. Um, our final speaker is uh, Dr. Appel. Uh, Dr. Appel is professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and vice chair of adult psychology at UCSF. Dr. Appel. Thank you so much. I'm just so pleased to be here with you all and to tell you about nutrition and mental health. So uh, can, can <clears throat> you see, I can't see <laughs> what's on the screen. Okay, so I am going to show slides in a few minutes, but I want to first uh, talk to you about the status of this field. I consider this an orphan field. I started studying stress, depression, and eating behavior many decades ago with Kelly Brownell, who pointed out, we don't know the fundamentals of why some people eat more during stress, some people eat less. Um, we also have a kind of increased cravings and reward drive when we're stressed and when we in certain types of depression. And so these relationships are clinically meaningful and I will show you that. Yet there has been so little systematic research in this area and so little funding to actually do trials to manipulate these. So um, let me show you where the field is at.
Are you sharing your, okay. Okay, that, there's the awkward Zoom moment of sharing the screen. So um, let me uh, tell you, I have no conflicts of interest and I have been, I'm gonna show you the clinical relationships in humans, although there is incredibly elegant rodent models of how um, stress and sugar drunk, junk food condition the brain and the reward center to have compulsive behavior and binge eating and, that, and um, increased intra-abdominal fat. My very first study um, was looking at uh, the relationship between increased body shape of apple shape or intra-abdominal fat and finding that people with that shape had exaggerated stress reactivity as well as cravings and uh, emotional eating. So the nexus we're looking at is between stress mood and uh, eating. Do people when they're stressed eat a lower quality diet? Do they eat, do they overeat? And then the reverse direction, this is a bi-directional relationship. Do, does certain nutrients create or promote depressed mood, anxious mood? And then briefly we'll go to interventions. So the triad is here. We have mental health, poor nutrition, chronic disease, and really these are very intertwined relationships. We need experimental studies and uh, mainly interventions to manipulate these in humans. The common link between these is the reward center and hedonic drive. Uh, so um, in terms of aging, I will just, uh, most of these studies are in uh, young or midlife adults, but the relevance to aging is simply this, that when we see factors, stress and comfort food together, promoting insulin resistance, visceral fat, risk for diabetes, we know we're looking at early precursors to later dementia. And here are some beautiful recent reviews showing these relationships that obesity uh, is associated with certain types of dementia, such as vascular dementia. And then this review at the bottom showing that midlife obesity, and in many cases, uh, abdominal fat, regardless of obesity, predicts dementia decades later. So what are the causes of the causes? How does stress impact diet? I'm on a low carb diet. Whenever I feel low, I eat, I eat carbs. Many people may relate to that. Um, the ticker tape shows that. We know that during rep uh, recessions, alcohol, cigarette, chocolate sales, candy sales, they actually remain stable while everything, all the other stocks fall or they go up. We can imagine that's happening in COVID. People have talked about COVID-10, COVID-15. This relationship between stress and eating is there's so many books I can't keep up. So clearly this is a, a very significant problem for the public. Um, we know that in a, a sample of UK adults during lockdown, 48% increased eating and their cravings explain this. So it's the stress increasing reward drive and the cravings are driving the overeating and particularly of uh, hot, sweet and palatable food. I'm so happy to be giving this talk in 2020. There are so many great reviews and meta-analyses out in this area. So here you can see the association between perceived stress in community samples and diet quality. The effect size is minus 0.34 from small to medium effect, showing that higher stress is associated with poor diet quality and not, and you know, according to a um, alternative healthy eating index, et cetera, but not only that, it was related to um, excess sweetened beverages, sweets, um, and lower intake of whole foods and fruits and vegetables. Not surprising, but this is a meaningful, significant relationship we can modify. Stress increases drive for comfort food, and this is, uh, and then stress plus comfort food actually leads to very well-defined pathways of <clears throat> innervation and uh, adiposity in the visceral fat area. This is the classic study on this showing that junk food alone did not increase the visceral fat of rodents, but, but when we stressed them, that plus junk food actually created a very acute syndrome of early metabolic disease. How does stress affect weight gain? We know in many studies such as Whitehall that job stress predicts 
uh, increased intra-abdominal fat as well as obesity over time. Here's a new study in Swedish adults showing the same. So this is a developmental relationship during adulthood that is we know now is later predicting dementia. I study clinical samples uh, who are either depressed or stressed. Caregivers gained um, excessive intra-abdominal fat compared to controls over a two-year period. How does, okay, so now I'm gonna focus. So I showed you cross-sectional relationships uh, mostly, and I'm going to show you some interventions where we try to reduce stress and see if we can reduce abdominal fat. But first, let's talk about the other arrow, which is from nutrition to mood. There are 15 population-based studies showing that whole foods are associated with lower depression, anxiety, stress, processed foods, and the, the Western diet is associated with elevated poor mental health. There are eight clinical trials on B-complex showing improvement in mental well-being. There are also small studies on micronutrients. Um, these are pioneered by Julia Rutgridge and Bonnie Kaplan, and they should not be ignored. This is such an underfunded field, and these small trials are extremely promising. So if it, you know, we always want a pill, so if we can actually, in some cases, um, help uh, really um, resolve some of these mental health issues with full spectrum micronutrients, we should be putting all of our research attention on that. So there are now some studies, particularly by Felice Jaca um, in Australia, manipulating diet to see if we can, le uh, if it can reduce depression. Here's the first small study in people with major depression an increase in the Mediterranean diet led to 32% remission of major depression. There are no pharma uh, pharmacotherapy studies that can lead to that type of remission. So this is a, uh, we need to really um, go further here. There is no mystery about why we see these relationships. We know that the nutrients we eat directly translate into the neurotransmitters that regulate our mood and mental health. This is a beautiful recent review on diet and depression. Many different pathways. Inflammation is a, clearly one of the most established between a poor uh, Western or junk diet, inflammation, and poor mood. So here's the rainbow. Choose your rainbow. One. Um, is more you know, addictive and let's just say pro-aging. And so we're really fighting with the reward center here and with advertising when we think about how to promote the healthy rainbow. Um, we've done some interventions. These are clinical interventions where we're targeting stress and overeating of comfort food and reducing sugar and saying, can we improve metabolic health by going after both of these pathways? Um, in one of our clinical trials, all of these studies are now published, we find that we can promote better glucose control a year later by adding a self-regulation component to weight loss that helps people with stress eating. Reduced hedonic drive is a very important target that's reducing, that's promoting success in weight loss. Uh, okay, so in terms of mechanisms, we know that binge eaters are particularly vulnerable and particularly benefit from self-regulation and targeting reward center. When we add the mindfulness, we see the people with binge eating improve their metabolic health a year and a half later. We just published that. Um, we've been looking at pregnancy, such an important critical period for uh, targeting this stress eating link. And what we found in a 200 pregnant women was that when we promoted mindful eating and helped them manage their, um, their nutrition better, reducing sugar, we found that the women had, who got the intervention compared to weightless had better glucose control. Nikki Bush is studying their infants. We're finding uh, many different benefits of targeting um, nutrition and stress during pregnancy to less infant illness, better stress responses, and less uh, rapid infant growth. So sugar is really um, an additive that is part explaining a lot of what I'm talking about. We've tried to educate people about sugar. The solution, of course, lies in what we're promoting and creating in the um, market. And so we took away sugar beverages at UCSF. We found that it reduced intra-abdominal fat of our sample of 200 
heavy soda drinkers. And so it was the easiest low, you know, low cost intervention. We now have hospitals doing this. It's a private sector way to help your employee health, but it's certainly not a public health solution. We need to look at the beverages um, that are surrounding people. Sorry, so, Lisa, could you please wrap up? Yes, we found that we saved money. We found that we saved carbon. Um, there's a paper by David Cle Cleveland showing that we reduced the carbon output by just the sales map. So I've shown you some strong observational data, some data, some very promising clinical trials um, and co-targeting both mental health and uh, comfort food has important health benefits. I just want to say I have no conflicts of interest. My interest is in talking with you and stakeholders and particularly those in the food industry about how we can promote these, um, these foods that will have positive feedback loops as well for promoting positive health rather than the kind of addictive sugar loop that we're um, currently promoting and seeing. So uh, thank you so much, I'll end there. Well, thank you so much, Alyssa, and thank you all the speakers for that wonderful and engaging uh, presentation. As someone who gives pre uh, talks, I know it's so difficult to fit a meaningful presentation on a, such complex topics in 10 minutes, and you all did a brilliant job of, of doing that. So thank you so much. So now we're going to begin the discussion session. And as a reminder, please type your questions in the chat box and indicate if the question is intended for one of the speakers or all of the speakers. And um, so while we're looking at the questions, I'm gonna start off by um, asking actually Lisa a couple of questions. Uh, so Lisa, you mentioned that um, most of the uh, cases with Alzheimer or, or the women had a higher incidence of Alzheimer and dementia compared to, to men. So uh, can you tell us why there is this difference? What are some of the underlying mechanisms for the difference in terms of susceptibility? Okay, thank you so much for that question. We used to believe that the reason that we saw a higher prevalence in women opposed to versus men is because women tend to live longer than men do. But some more recent science, science has made the suggestion that it has some is more to do with some of the chemical differences between men and women and really estrogen or the lack of estrogen as we face menopause. Mm -hmm. But the science is still evolving in this area, but thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And then another question, sort of related question, was that you also mentioned that there were some racial and ethnic differences in terms of uh, incidence or susceptibility to Alzheimer. And, and again, I wanted to know whether those were because of genetic differences or did the environment, um, environmental factors um, had anything to do with it? Once again, another very good question. You don't mess around. <laughs> Well, it's probably a combination of those, um, but they're, you know, one of the things that we are looking at at CDC are some of the social determinants of health. So we are looking at how people's backgrounds, and I'm saying that very broadly, help them develop into the person that they are in through adulthood. So in other words, the educational experience, as we know, education is a protective factor, or we believe it's a protective factor related in relation to Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So it's not necessarily just the quantity of education that a person has. It, 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 it can be also that the type of educational experiences that they've had. So in other words, you know, a, a, I mean, I grew up in rural America with one elementary school and one high school. And so that's a very different experience than my children who grew up in, in Atlanta in a private school. Um, so very differences in those educational trajectories, as well as environmental exposures, as well as nutritional um, exposures. So there is a genetic component, but also it's our experiences and that's very broadly. Well, thank you. And I was wondering if any of the other uh, speakers would wanted to respond to uh, either of the question or uh, wanted to add anything to what Lisa already said. I guess not, so, so I will start with, with the, the first question that came from the attendees. And that question is actually um, posed to everyone. So uh, 
what about the question is what about these commercials on products on TV that suggest that may assist with promoting um, maintaining good health and memory, balance of nature, powdered fruits and vegetables, and focus factors for improved memory? Any support for these? Okay, I'll start first. Um, I would encourage people to look at the evidence on the commercial materials that are available. Um, I would also encourage you, um, AARP has a global council of brain health. And what they do is they bring in experts on a variety of different topics related to Alzheimer's disease and uh, related dementias. And one of the reports that the AARP Global Council on Brain Health led by Sarah Locke looked at was nutraceuticals. So they looked at a lot of those supplements. And so if you look at that report, it'll provide you what the state of the science was then. But I would encourage people, especially if they have limited means, um, to look at the data on, the medi on those supplements before they choose to spend their dollars on them. And I mean, I, I can't agree more, actually. I think recently I've been looking into <clears throat> some of this related to, to other health outcomes and I've been very surprised by the lack of evidence that supports the claim that are made. I mean, maybe they're effective, but I, I don't see very few, very few of them have anything to support them. So I think uh, I would encourage everyone to really look at um, the evidence. Some of them do, but, but I think it's important to consider that. Um, other panelists, David, Barbara. Well, for me, I think um, you have to look at what the supplement is. Um, like I said in my talk, I think whole foods, because of the synergy of the ingredients or what's in the food, um, can sometimes be more effective than sing single ingredients. Um, but as you said, you know, if there's good science to look at one single ingredient, you know, maybe that might uh, be better. But as far as I know, um, I don't see that in the commercial products like you, like you were saying. Yeah, I fully agree with uh, Barbara and Lisa. Um, the main issue I think is the, the health claims. Uh, Sometimes, you know, there are commercials, but uh, there's no real health claim behind. They just disguised behind the fact that uh, it's good for you. Uh, it's made from fruit and vegetables, uh, but at the end of the day, it might be related more like to processed food, which might be potentially even more dangerous than being beneficial. Um, so look at the, to look at the, uh, the evidence is, is one of the critical points really. Um, second point as well is maybe to, to, to really be careful. Uh, I suspect, you know, uh, a balanced diet uh, is probably better than any supplement, uh, exercise, lifestyle factors. Uh, and also maybe, you know, uh, taking care of uh, people around us. Um, it's, uh, I think, when you look at the evidence, uh, food patterns seems to be better, like Mediterranean diet or all of these uh, kind of uh, pattern food. Um, so I think it's what people are trying to reproduce, but there's no real health claim behind. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And so the uh, other question is actually for for Barbara, and I would follow with sort of a related question, Barbara, maybe I combine the, the two of them. So the question is, how does the magnitude of the difference between different berries compare to the magnitude of difference between independent repli replication with the same berry e extract? What's the batch to batch variability in composition of the berry extract? And maybe I'll add my question to it, which is, uh, do you have you done a studies with uh, using combination of these these berries to see whether there is synergistic effect by putting them all together or are there actually some sometimes there could be antagonistic effect when you put you know a few things um, together okay thanks for the question um, so we have um so it is difficult, first of all, the batch to batch variation, obviously in foods, um, especially fruits, there can be some batch to batch differentiation. So the commissions that we work with, like the Strawberry Commission, um, they actually come up with a research mix, which is a, um, a mixture of different fruits um, from, that are sold in the stores. 
So it's it's the food, it's the strawberries that you're getting in the stores and it's a good mix. And, you know, you do see that variation, but hopefully that variation isn't too much that you would see a difference in your outcome measures. Um, and then we haven't done a uh, trial, a human trial comparing like a blueberry versus a strawberry. So these two were separate trials. So I can't really say like the magnitude of the difference between unless you do them in the same trial. But we have done um, some combinations in our cell models and we find that they're not necessarily um, synergistic with each other. So they seem to definitely also in our cell models have different um, pathways that they're working on. So like if you combine the two, you don't get twice as good a protection, you know what I'm saying? But you don't get half as good a protection either. So they seem to, to be doing something independently of each other as well as some have some of the similar benefits, but it, it's a complicated question until we do it in a, an animal trial or a human trial, I can't really answer that question. Samin, I think you're on mute. Thank you so much. There's some background noise, so I try to put myself <laughs> on mute as much as possible. But anyway, David, um, David and, and um, Elisa and Elisa, any, any other things to add to what Barbara said? Um, I, I'll start. Uh, there are a few studies actually looking at interaction between food bioactives, um, trying to probably try to reproduce this uh, Mediterranean diet style, for example. Um, so, for example, you have component uh, which were made by a company like Nutricia, where, where they mixed uh, DHA, which is long chain fatty acids, uh, selenium. Uh, there was also vitamin B, which are very important, um, things like this. And uh, it worked. It worked uh, in healthy aging. And then actually, it didn't work that much in people with uh, Alzheimer's disease or, or starting of dementia. There are also work done recently by a collaborator of Barbara, I think. Uh, it's um, Robert Krikorian, uh, looking at the impact of fish oil and blueberries together. Uh, although actually you see the impact of individual components, when they mix it together, they lost that impact. So it's important just to, to assess uh, the feasibility and uh, sometimes we are thinking that you know putting two nice things together may, may be additive, but um, we are surprised to see the opposite uh, effect really. Uh, so we have to be very careful when it comes to antagonism and uh, synergism of components. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so actually the next question, David, is, uh, is uh, posed to you and, and it's related to microbiome. So the question is, um, that you mentioned shift in microbiome seen uh, with aging. Is the same shift seen with healthy aging as well as disease aging? If so, is there believed to be any benefit whole body for the occurrence of this shift? That is a very interesting question. And I don't think I have the right answer for this. Um, in fact, your microbiome is your own, uh, the host, shaping his own microbiome. So everybody has a different microbiome and we don't know exactly what a healthy microbiome is. If we did actually, we would really be rich right now. Um, so yes, I think what happened is as we get older, our microbiome shift. Uh, the reason for this is because our endocrine system is shaping more, more or less your, 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 your gut as well, but also we have uh, less diversity in our food. Sometimes, you know, we get older, we have trouble to masticate, for example, to swallow. So we tend to eat different type of food. And obviously that is going to affect the way your bugs in the gut are going to change. Now in disease, um, the shift in the microbiome in disease is called dysbiosis. And that could be triggered by many, many parameters uh, including inflammation and inflammation, for example. Um, but it's very difficult to understand. We know that, for example, autistic syndrome or people with Alzheimer's disease may present with a different microbiome, whether that microbiome is specific signature to the disease. No, we're not sure yet. And we don't even know what clusters of bacteria are involved. Uh, difficult to say really at the moment. You unmute, Simon. Forgot again to unmute myself, but 
So the next question, thank you, thank you, David, for, for that. Um, so the next question is for Dr. Uh, Appel, uh, and uh, it's asked if treatment of depression emphasizes medications and psychological support. What's being done to include nutrition and diet as a core intervention for patients with depression? Really very good question. Alyssa? Yes, thank you. I really appreciate that question. We should be asking that question, given the data that you just saw, given the consistency of the, the very meaningful relationships between our diet and our mental health, why, why is that not in the treatment pipeline? It's not. Um, we need much more commercial interest in that question. That's partly why these, you know, these studies aren't funded. But let me tell you that in my ideal vision, well, first of all, this question makes me very sad. And I have people in my family and many of you, um, all of you know someone struggling with mental illness, with depression, with anxiety, who have been giving drugs. The meta-analyses show that most of them show there is no benefit over placebo for the typical depression, for moderate, mild to moderate depression, yet it is first line of treatment, first line. And there are so many bad effects and some of these are so hard to get off of, like effects are, and they can promote overeating and weight gain. So it's just a tragedy what's happened with our treatment of mental health. Now, first line of treatment, in, in my view, would be, uh, would be trying some of these nutritional therapies first. They are self-care. They are low cost. So um, omega-3 uh, free fatty acids. So the, you know, the meta-analyses have shown that these even help in children and of course preventing um, a lifelong chronic disease like, like depression you know, should start there, making sure DHA is in it. So one of the, um, the other, the micronutrient studies are, uh, they're so promising, they're so small. We, we really need funding for some of these trials. There mm -hmm. are companies like Hardy and True Hope that sell a lot of these. We just don't have data, but they, uh, the idea is this, these mental disorders arise from many, many causes, not necessarily nutrition. When you flood the brain with the right micronutrients, you can still see remission in the mental health issue, even though it may not be the primary cause. So I really do, th I think exercise, there's plenty of evidence that aerobic exercise prevents uh, can actually cure depression. And uh, of course, you know, the, the stress reduction is, should be offered to everyone and it's, you know, and it's cheap and it's on our phones now. Thank you. But uh, Alyssa, are there efforts, you know, as someone who is in the midst of all of this, are you aware of efforts to really include uh, nutrition as part of the treatment or prevention protocol for the physicians um, to, to recommend? No, um, I will say, I don't view it as a conflict of interest, but I am on the board of the John W. Brick Foundation. It's a new foundation and that's exactly their goal. Uh, they are, I mean, they are wanting to educate um, the, you know, the whole line of um, mental health treatment providers so that a first line of defense is trying some of these things. They've put treadmills in, in you know, in inpatient wards and, and just heard the anecdotes flowing of how much it helped the adolescents and other people. So um, there is a public health, both education issue. And I do think if we had more research on this, it would, it would be helpful. I think, you know, it's, it's such a problem that there's no commercial interest behind it. No one is ready to fund these studies. NIH doesn't have a nutrition. There's no champion at NIH for these, you know, supplements or nutritional studies with mental health. And, and Lisa, do you, do, would you like to add anything to that? I would, thank you so much for asking. Um, you know, just to kind of bring this conversation about depression back to cognition. So one of the things that we do know is that depression does impair people's cognition. So they may, um, the, it may be depression as opposed to maybe some change, permanent changes in their cognitive functioning. But I think an important conversation for us to also have too, especially in, during this pandemic with COVID-19, is we also need to think about the, 
the so I mean, think about nutrition from the aspect is nutrition for many of us, our, our dining, our eating is a social time and a show opportunity for us to engage with each other. And for many people, that opportunity has been reduced or to or has been minimized. So we also have to think about um, not just the depression or the we need to think, I think, more broadly, too, about some of the consequences and some of the long term impact that we're going to see in the next few months with the COVID epidemic or pandemic um, related to the impact that it has on had on nutrition for people, because at some point people some people have changed their diets very drastically. Some people have lost lots of weight. Others have not. They've changed their dress, their diet drastically in the other directions or the types of foods that they have, as well as, you know, we're concerned about older adults who were getting a hot meal um, daily at their senior center, um, which are not having that opportunity now. There might be some changes in Meals on Wheels and some other national programs, too, that can have a definitely an impact on the older adults as well and their cognitive functioning and their social well-being. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um... Lisa for mentioning that because the relationship between the social interaction, food as a vehicle for social in interaction, and then the brain um, cognition is so important. And, and it's sort of like a vicious cycle if it's not attended to. And I think I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned the, COVID, you know, the recent epidemic because uh, you know, somebody needs to be doing some studies on this related to what the impact has been in terms of both um, the appetite, food intake, nutrition, and then also the social interaction and the co cognition. So I think that's a very important cycle to consider overall. Um, others, any, David, Barbara, any comments to add to that? Well, um, yeah, I'm aware of studies going, at least in the UK and in Australia, uh, looking into this COVID-19 uh, impact. Uh, they have large cohorts, for example, in the UK called Prospect, uh, where they do cognitive testing on lines on the cloud. And they are now also collecting food frequency questionnaires to just understand how COVID-19 is affecting your food uh, habits. And can we correlate that with change in cognitive functioning? Because they are having about 25,000 people uh, registered onto this uh, study. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what the results are. Uh, and I know some people as well in Australia, in Melbourne, essentially, uh, they're doing the same work at the moment. So let's wait and see. I mean, I think within the next few months, we should see some results, um, very interesting results re related to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, all right. So the next question is a lot of good questions. So thank you, all the attendees, for bringing up this question. So, uh, the question is actually to all the panelists, and it it's, uh, says that some of the speakers focused on polyphenols as a potential mechanistic target. But in preclinical studies, rodent diets frequently lack any dietary fiber except cellulose, which may not have any benefits, whereas the doses of berries being provided also contain complex dietary fibers. How are those different potential mechanisms are sorted out? I think I'll start, if I may. Um, so in our rodent studies, we used a chow diet as the, as the background diet, which is already healthy and well fortified and does have fiber. Um, but I do understand that, you know, fiber is a component in these foods. And it's always a question of, you know, do we take the fiber out of the placebo or not? Um, but for me, it's eating the whole food and the whole food um, does contain fiber, does contain polyphenols, does contain other vitamins and minerals. So for me, it's whatever's in that food and how it's working synergistically, all the, com all the components. Um, so we don't try to sort out like, is this just due to the polyphenols? Um, because we're looking at the whole food essentially. Thank you so much. Um, David, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. I mean, um, I agree with Barbara. Um, we, we, including now uh, polyphenols into our rodent diets um, uh, for the, the animal studies, uh, this is done normally by companies. The, the company I'm working with, for example, is in the US. Uh, and they developed very recently this new diet, which is actually enriched with fibers, which is very close to normal diet you'll find actually in humans. 
now when we do our clinical trials, uh, we're supplementing people with that supplement, polyphenol supplement, but we're not asking them to change their eating behavior. Instead, we are actually recording food frequency questionnaires, food diaries, and we're using those as a factor when we do our analysis. Uh, essentially, when it comes to cluster for microbiome diversity, for example, we want to investigate whether some of these fibers may have been dragging that effect rather than our components. So this is a confounding factor for us in our very complex uh, bioinformatic analysis. So yeah, th th thank you, David and Barbara. And maybe I can add something to this because we recently did a study with adding um, a good amount of fruits and vegetables, almost about 15% to the diet of the um, of the mice, and you know, which contained berries and and all kinds of other fiber containing products. But when you actually compare the level of fiber that is added that is provided by, by the fruits and vegetable in the mixture of the animal diet compared to the differences in the polyphenols. Uh, polyphenols and other antioxidants really stand out as sort of being the major component, although there is uh, obviously contribution from the fiber, particularly not so much the level of fiber, but probably the type of fiber that is being provided by fruits and vegetables. So. Uh, let's see, the, another question, which is again um, posed to all the panelists. Uh, so the question is, it seems to me that the con uh, connection between poor nutrition, poor health is more of an environmental and public policy problem rather than a scientific one, i.e. poor food environment created by uh, profit motives. Uh, what kind of scientific evidence would be necessary to force them Reckoning of public opinion and policymakers. Who would like to start? I guess I'll start from um, a, a public health perspective, which may um, work with some of the public opinion and the policymakers. I, I think really having uh, the national academies have a report or some type of a consensus document that, that may already exist, um, demonstrating the actual impact. I think that is with calling recommendations uh, for other people to act upon, I think is always extremely useful. Um, I also think that um, being able to have some clear data that indicates um, the, the direct correspondence between the nutrition or the diet, the quality maybe of the diet, and I'm not a nutritionist, that somebody intakes and the impact that that has over their life course. I think that can, as much data as we can have, and if we say that we could, for example, reduce something bad in a person's diet and that it would maybe prevent vent or delay or mitigate a risk by a certain percentage. Some of those kind of ROI types of things, I think are always extremely very powerful to policymakers. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Alisa, you've been quiet. So would you like to say something about this? You, yeah, of course you do know that I have, a, um, I love this question. I thank you for answer, answering it. And I have so much to say. So I'll try to be extremely concise the relationship between um, the food industry, which is what we're eating, you know, which produces what we're eating with a strong correlation and our public health is a scientific question that has been proven. So yes, there is the strongest link between uh, food and mental and physical health is, um, you know, it, there needs to be no more science on this. We know that our sick, uh, population starts early because of the food we eat. And I just, you know, I, I am so excited to be talking at the food forum to people who are interested, to those of you in industry, we have so many companies here. Can we please have a dialogue about how you can still make profit by feeding people healthy food, not processed food? And the co-benefits to the environment, to our mental and physical health 
are not only phenomenal, they are a life and death matter for us and our planet. And you know, we have only a few years to make huge changes with the climate. So um, can we please add that to this discussion? It's all tied in very tightly. Yeah, I mean, I, I do uh, agree, uh, Lisa, that there needs to be a lot more conversation between the academia, government, and the industry as to the problems that we're facing in terms of food and health. And I think we can only do it all together. So I totally agree with you that the, you know, this needs to be part of the conversation of a multi-sector year um, uh, gathering. And I think what Food Forum is doing to bring all of us together is, is wonderful. And, and I hope that they will continue to have this this conversation. So, and, and I just want to add that the focus on specific foods is so interesting. It's such great science. I, I'm so happy with what I've learned today. And it's a very privileged question. And so, optimizing, you know, long, optimal longevity. And I'm an aging researcher, and I have for, you know, almost 20 years been studying optimizing longevity, maintaining our telomeres. But the question about diet patterns and the sources you know, of our food is really the public health question. Okay, so let's get to another question, which is always of interest to, to many. And that is again, addressed to, the, to all the panelists. And that has to do with organic versus non-organic. Are there differences between the health benefits of organic versus non-organic, fresh versus frozen, supplement versus food, you know, whole food. So, uh, I think there's a lot of interest both in terms of uh, on the part of consumers about all these questions. So I'll be very curious to know what each of the panelists uh, think. And, and of course I have my own, my own opinion and I'd be happy to share it afterwards. So um, who would like to start? Barbara, you, you were quiet. So do you wanna start? Sure. Um, so we have collaborators that have looked at the polyphenol um, quantities in fresh um, versus frozen, and there are no differences. So in fact, frozen might even be a little bit better because they're picked you know, at the time that they're really ripe and flash frozen, a lot of them. Um, when you cook them, however, um, the, the foods release more of the, pro, of the polyphenols quicker, but they degrade faster. So you have to be careful about how fast you eat something once you cook it. Um, all our studies were done with non-organic fruits. So um, having not done a comparison, I can't really say much if one is better than the other, but clearly um, in our studies, the non-organic fruits um, had health benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa. I was gonna say, I really don't have anything to add to this conversation. I think Alyssa probably has more than I do. Okay. Uh, let's get to David and then we get to Elisa. Well, uh, I agree with uh, Barbara. I mean, um, the, I mean, on the polyphenol side, at least, you know, uh, cooking is going to affect uh, the concentration of those polyphenols. Uh, whether you're steaming, you're boiling, whether you're microwaving, all of these parameters are going to affect your concentration. Now, I don't have much idea about, you know, organic versus non-organic. Um, I didn't really look into it, to be honest. Uh, so I can't really add on this topic at all, uh, but yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Elisa. Um, so yes, there's still, you know, still an active important research area. I would say when things are, you know, studied, I think that rather than trying to look at, you know, small gains and added nutritional benefits, I think the, the bigger picture is that local and organic farming is, is healthier for communities all around. So, I mean, I'm guilty of going to Trader Joe's and buying imported, you know, packaged, commercially produced um, produce. But, you know, in terms of like the moves that we, yeah, just the big picture about our public health goals and in uh, what we can do with smaller, you know, farms. It is now a part of Biden's proposal for, you know, for looking at climate. It is also a social justice issue. Um, so there, in so many ways, we need to think about going to these, you know, changing our agricultural models. Right. No, I and and I totally agree with what was said. I think the benefit of 
organic versus non-organic. -or um, to uh, you, you know, it's more for for the environment for. Um, other purposes, I, I think that from what I understand, looking at the literature in terms of the nutritional content, there's not a much additional benefit or, or any benefit in terms of uh, organic versus non-organic. And then when we think about accessibility, given that organic is more expensive than non-organic, I think um, we need to, to be, um, aware that, um, um, of, of the fact that, that um, many might not be uh, able, who, who actually would need it most might not be able to afford organic. So I think it's important to emphasize the fact that there's not sort of in terms of the nutritional content, there's not much of a difference, but there, I, I love the way that, that uh, Alyssa put it, that for the community health, it's a good thing. And, and I think we should certainly uh, push for that. Um, so with that, I think- So Samin, can I add one little thing to that? Sure. So I think we have to look at like sort of what Alyssa was saying, like the overall food patterns. So eating an organic berry versus a non-organic berry isn't as big a change as eating a berry versus potato chips. So yeah. I think it's like, you're, you know, looking at organic versus non-organic is a small change compared to the, a larger change where you would su substitute a healthier food in your diet for a non-healthy food. Thank, thank you for that comment. And so we only have about five minutes or actually four minutes. It's amazing how time will fly fast if you're having a good time. At least we are, I hope the attendees are as well. But so let's uh, get to the last uh, question, uh, which is uh, what type of studies are in the works or may be what does the future of this field look like? And each of you has 30 seconds to say that. This is like a debate, presidential debate. You have 30 seconds to say that and then we have to stop. I'll I start I'll maybe. Oh, you go, Lisa, please. Okay. I, I guess I will build on something that someone else already said about some of these conversations that we have are really conversations of privilege. And um, we also need to, I think, to look at, I mean, I think a lot of people have the question organic versus non-organic, frozen versus fresh, but we also have to look at various parts of our country and across the world that have food deserts where people can't ask the question, um, you know, can I get a fresh banana or a fresh whatever because they're not available there or things are very highly processed or packaged. Mm -hmm. All right, David? Yeah, I think a, a topic which has not uh, been um, highlighted here is how we respond to diet and the, this individual variability you observe in response to any diet. Uh, on top of this, you also have the issue of sustainability, the issue as well of uh, beliefs and uh, food patterns like Lisa mentioned, like if you're a vegan or a vegetarian or what type of food you eat and the food dessert as well, where some people may not have a choice. Um, but I think um, so the, the future really at the moment for us is to look into the impact of a uh, certain type of food uh, and how you respond to this food, uh, in particular looking at high versus low responders, uh, because we want to understand a bit more like the more personalized approach to nutrition. Thank you. So I agree yeah. with David um, that personalized nutrition is going to be a hot topic in the future. And it's something that I also started to look at in the lab is, is someone with cognitive deficits more um, benefit, is there more benefit to that type of person than someone who, who's cognitively normal at age 70, say? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's gonna be important. As well as how often do you have to eat these foods? Is it better to eat them every day or is it better to eat them every once in a while? Um, uh, you know, as well. Lisa. Okay. The, um... So I think that aging starts in the womb and that we know, you know, looking at pregnancy and, and, and women and men, because we know of epigenetics and sperm, that transmission of health means that we really need to look at um, early in life pregnancy, people of childbearing age, and really optimize their health. 
And so I, you know, I think this science of um, optimal nutrition for longevity is fascinating, but first we need to get rid of the toxic food and toxic stress because that is what is creating the early, um, the prenatal program effects and the, the early obesity that we're seeing. So really look, thinking of early life means it's a lifespan approach because the sperm, the health of the sperm and eggs going into it um, means that we can't just think of pregnancy, but actually preconception and, and young adults of childbearing age and their health is shaped by um, their childhood. So really, um, yes, I'll just stop yeah. there. <laughs> So thank you so much. Uh, so I want to really thank all of the speakers for the excellent discussion. I want to thank the audience for staying till the bitter end and, and the organizer of this wonderful symposium. And I just want to remind everyone that today's webinar was recorded and the recording and presentation slides will be posted to the food forum in the coming weeks. So thank you again for your participation and I hope that you will join the, the food forum for future events. Thank you all and have a wonderful day.